So I would like to welcome you to our uh, lecture series on the Guadal community. I'm excited to give the first lecture of this series. And as the title say, uh, today I'm going to present a gentle introduction to Guadal Computer for Guadal Computer. And uh, <laughs> let me start by saying that the future of quantum computing is bright with the potential of many and um, revolutionary applications right? in fields ranging from um, medicine to finance to cybersecurity. That being said, it is going to, get, to take a few years before we, this new technology gets access, via, is accessible to us. However, in this, in this um, research training group, our goal is to discuss what are the opportunities and the challenges that this new technology is presenting, and at the same time to see how mathematics can play a role in the advancement in the advancement of the field. So, let me start. And I'm going to start uh, with some elements from the early uh, history. And I'm going to refer to some of the giants of computation and quantum computation. And starting from Alan Turing and, and his groundbreaking world work on Hilbert's uh, tenth problem. And we're going to continue with two giants of quantum computing, Richard Feynman, Feynman a, a physicist, and Yuri Manin, um, a mathematician, who presented this idea of computation grounded in physics. So this was very revolutionary when uh, it occurred. And so in this talk, I'm going to say a few things about what is quantum computation and this idea of storing and processing information. And I'm going to spend some time um, on discussing the state of the art, what is the available uh, hardware, what is the available technology at the, at the moment, uh, after I present some basic concepts of what is quantum bit, measurement, the concept of superposition and entanglement, and I will continue by trying to answer, answer the question, why so much buzz uh, about quantum computing? And we are going to uh, discuss also some potential applications that, that in the long run may be accessible to us. So let me get started. Um, we cannot start a, a discussion on computation without referring to Alan Turing, who in 1936, at the age of 24, uh, presented this notion of a universal machine, later called the Turing machine, capable of uh, computing anything that is, co that is computable. So Alan Turing was a mathematician, cryptographer, and pioneer in computer science, whose life was one of secret tri trials and public tragedy. And he was prosecuted for his uh, sexual orientation, the, and he was sub subjected to some medical treatment that was inappropriate. And the, the British uh, government apologized to him only in 2009, officially. For, for the treatment that he, he was imposed. So what he is, uh, main, one of his main contributions was the so-called so the Turing machine, which is a mathematical model of computation described in an abstract machine that manipulates symbols on strips of tape according to a table of rules. Despite the model simplicity, it is capable of implementing any computer algorithm. So what um, Alan Turing is best known nowadays in the public was his contribution in breaking the um, Enigma, Enigma code in World War II. Um, but even at that time, he was a mathematician of ex extraordinary uh, capability. At the age of, as soon as he entered undergraduate studies at Cambridge, he focused his attention in one of the hardest problems, and that was the decision problem and Seidman's problem. This problem was laid out by David Hilbert, 
Um, so, so what does the problem say? It's one of the major problems of 22nd uh, century. Uh, the challenge is to provide a general algorithm which for any given D of adding equation can decide whether the equation has a solution um, with an unknowns taking integer value. So this was an abstract problem and um, it was Alan Turing, the one who uh, took it on. And uh, in some sense, he managed to, to obtain the, the, the correct solution that such an algorithm cannot be designed. But in order to do so, he um, presented a new concept, a new notion of computational procedure, of what the computational procedure is. So let's... So this is one, since we're going to later on during this uh, process, you're going to see images of the current technology. I just thought of putting up um, one of the first machines that were created uh, in 1871. This is from the Science Museum of London in England. And it was uh, the, the analytical engine by Charles uh, Babbage, Babbage, Babbage. And um, notice that this uh, machine has four components. There is here a mill, there is a reader, there is um, a way to print it. And supposedly, um, it was going to be powered by steam. And this gave a uh, rise to a very interesting field, thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is a branch of physics that deals with heat, work, and temperature, and their relation to, to energy, radiation, and the properties of matter. This um, um, was developed to increase the efficiency of the uh, steam engine. So the, the goal of the, of the whole field, uh, the initiation, was um, the desire to create an efficient steam engine. And I would like to bring to your attention that Maryland is now uh, the house of the quantum thermodynamics hub, which is um, an international net network. This quantum thermodynamic uh, la la uh, hub is uh, housed in IPS, uh, is led by Chris Arzinski and Nicole Junger Halpern. And uh, we plan to have a lot of interactions with that group because there is a lot of mathematics that can be of use in the study of quantum thermodynamics. So, so let's start now discussing more about the reason that we are here. What got the field started was this idea um, that the fact, the realization that certain quantum mechanical effects cannot be efficiently simulated on a classical computer. And as you see here is Richard, Richard Feynman, Feynman, a physicist, Yuri Manin, an algebraic geometer, a mathematician, a Russian mathematician. And these two guys independently created the formalism that it is now uh, credited for the development of uh, quantum computing. So the question that um, arise after their uh, realization was, what would it mean for computation if we somehow remove ourselves from the abstract uh, model? And um, what is the, uh, what it would mean for computation if it were grounded uh, in quantum physics, which is the actual physics of our universe? This was a very challenging question, actually, at the moment, because the original concept of computation was very abstract, and it was thought very difficult to come up with a concept of, of computation relying in physics. The next question that arises is, can these quantum effects be used to speed up computation? And in fact, nowadays, and we're going to see in this, um, not only in these talks, in this lecture that we're going to give throughout the semester, but also in the uh, research interaction team that we are going to run in, uh, throughout the year, that um, quantum algorithms 
Kanto why can do Kanto computer can do at least as much as classical computer, but also can uh, can uh, help us um, simulate mechanics um, more efficiently, which means uh, we can get a very dramatic speed up in connections with classical computers. When is this very useful and very important? This is very useful when the dimensionality of the problem is extremely, um, extremely hard. The next question is, what else can these quantum computers do well? Well, the original, uh, the quantum algorithms that have, um, that have been created, it turns out that they can solve certain problems um, with certainty, whereas classical computers could only produce a result with high probability. And this is something that it was counterintuitive. Uh, to the people that were interested in quantum computing, because quantum mechanics has certain probabilistic components. However, there were algorithms created, quantum algorithms, which could produce um, the answer uh, with certainty, while classical computers could only produce the result probabilistically. And this is a very, very famous quote by Richard Feynman, who realized that nature isn't classical and if you want to simulate nature then you better use the quantum mechanical effects and so it is a brute force type of thing but um it, is, it doesn't look easy but it is a wonderful problem as he stated so this was the motivation because behind the creation of um, the generation of this uh, field the genesis of this field the idea of simulating physics with computers. And let me, let's have a look at what is happening in our neighborhood. At the University of Maryland, there is a very extensive um, quantum ecosystem. And notice that we have something that not many universities in this um, in this country have the uh, Challenge Institute, the Institute for Robust Quantum Simulations. And uh, this is an NSF funded institute led by Adam Childs. And we have QUICS, the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science. Uh, Adam Childs is also involved there. We have the Joint Quantum Institute with many, many excellent faculty in, in physics, from physics, computer science, engineering, um, and NIST, even um, Gretchen Campbell, who is one of the two directors, is a, a scientist in NIST. We have the Quantum Thermotechnology Center, QTC, which is housed in engineering. And even the institutes that I lead, the Institute for Physical Science and Technology, is the house of the Math Quantum Research Training Group, the, the RTG, the Math Quantum RTG, the Quantum Thermodynamics Hub, hub that I mentioned. And actually, we are the house of the graduate certificate in quantum computing and um, masters of uh, professional studies of quantum computing. So this is the right place for something for this activity to take place. And I'm very excited that you are joining us in this effort. What prompted the field to take off? was the fact that the mathematician Peter Shaw in 1994 came back with a major breakthrough that changed the landscape of quantum computing. Of quantum computing. He, um, he produced the so-called, he came up with a factoring uh, algorithm. And what this algorithm could compute in days would take a supercomputer longer than the age of the universe. So this was something that startled the, the universe, actually, the people. And they start to worry because the fact that this algorithm was created um, was a little bit scary because it has the potential to break all public key encryption in standard use. So people realize that there is a danger if this um, algorithm is used. And so, of course, at the beginning, 
the people didn't realize its potential because they said quantum algorithms are not really robust and the quantum systems are fragile. So what are the possibilities that something like this could have a real use? Nowadays, though, the worry and uh, the reason for uh, skepticism in, is there again, because insights from the error correction, robust error correction, shows that there is a possibility something like this could be a reality in the near future, that we can have an algorithm that can really be of use. And that is related to the field of the error, quantum error correction. So let's see. So well, let me just put it out there. Just because a computer makes use of quantum effects does not make it a quantum computer. Each one of these, of these uh, machines use quantum effects. And it is not, believe me, it is not a quantum computer. So what a quantum computer does is, is that it changes our notion, our notion of uh, uh, information and of the way that uh, the information is stored and is being processed. So let's let's uh, get started a little bit about all this. So let's assume that. Um, uh, the story is as follows, if you have information that we store in, uh, let's say, in quantum system, uh, then um, this process uh, use quantum mechanical effects and a computer that can do these things, that can store and process uh, uh, information, can do potentially other something more, can, for instance, solve certain problems dramatically faster than ordinary classical computers. So nowadays we have examples of algorithms that provide exponential speed up uh, and polynomial or super polynomial speed, in up, speed, speed up. And this is connection with abstract problems like the approximation of topological invariance, but also practical problems. So we will, throughout this course, we will try to see a lot of uh, these uh, aspects of computation. So before I go into, um, into the first basic question of what is qubit, um, so we all know that classical computers are built, have as building block bits, classical bits, zero and one, state vector zero and one. What about, what is a qubit? Before I go into that, I would like to give you some um, a description of a photon, because it turns out that the photon is the simplest real realization of a qubit. And by studying the properties of the photon, we can understand the properties, the properties of quantum bits or qubits. So let's consider this very simple setup. We can have this setup uh, being demonstrated right here, for instance. So here is um, a Polaroid filter. We have a source of light. We have a Polaroid filter, but it is hori horizontally polarized. And when light passes through this filter, the, the light that it is horizontally polarized go through. If it is vertically polarized, it's getting blocked. This is the story. What, what is happening if it is something in between? Then if it is happening in between, a part of the light will go through and a part of the light will, will be blocked. So let's see. Uh, let's assume now that we are placing a second filter here that it is vertically polarized. If you now consider a light coming from this source, and um, this light, as soon as it crosses, the filter that it's horizontally polarized, it becomes horizontal. This is the rule. So what is happening now? This light that it is called horizontally polarized hits this filter, which is vertically polarized, and the light is being blocked. So no light goes through. So now the question is, this was a very simple experiment, but it's very elaborating because subsequently we're going to use these ideas to define qubits, multiple qubits, and many other 
concepts. So what is happening if now we place a filter that has polarization, say, 45 degrees? What is your guess? So you think that there will be some light coming through. So this is precisely the point. Even though it is counterintuitive, if you put an additional um, filter with 45 degree polarization, um, you are going to see that there will be a certain component that will pass through, and it will be able to pass even through the vertical and uh, the third filter, because there will be a component of this vector, but it is vertically polarized. Okay, so this was a very interesting elaborating um, example. So let's discuss about photon polarization. So it turns out that the polarization state of a photon, of a photon can be represented by a two-dimensional vector of unit um, length. So taking a horizontal component and vertical component as basis, any arbitrary polarization can be expressed as superposition. So by superposition here, we mean a linear combination. So any, any, um, any polarization um, can be expressed as a linear combination of uh, the vertical component and the horizontal component. And in this case, this A and B satisfy a certain condition, A squared plus B squared um, is equal to one. So, uh, and here I have made a comment that will be relevant in some of the subsequent lectures that allowing these two numbers to be complex enables this formalism to describe circular polarization, that it is very relevant for application. So in this particular um, notation, we are using a notation that is known as Dirac's notation. What I mean with that, this Dirac notation appears confusing, okay, we got uh, appears confusing, but in reality, this is not. You can think of this symbol, the ket of V, as simply a vector V. It is simply a notation for vectors. Uh, it would have been very simple for us as mathematicians to express this, rela this relation as C vector equal A, another vector plus B, a horizontal vector. So it would be much simpler notation, uh, but we follow the tradition of um, pattern computers and quadro mechanics, and we are going to be using this notation as a notation for vectors. So what do we mean by when we are talking about measurement of polarization? Well, polarization filters are quantum measuring devices. When we are talking about measuring devices, all we really mean are, um, as an example, uh, polarization filters. These filters can by themselves constitute a quantum measuring device. And what is the story? Well, quantum measurement always occur with respect to an orthogonal subspace decomposition associated um, with a measuring device. So for a horizontally polarized filter, the basis in which it measures is either uh, the horizontal component together with its perpendicular component. So a photon with polarization A vertical component plus B horizontal component is measured by a horizontal filter as this quantity absorbed with probability A squared or this quantity passed because if, as we discussed, if um, a, a light that is horizontally polarized passed through a horizontally polarized uh, measuring device, horizontally polarized filter. So, and this component passes with probability B squared. So any photon that passes through the filter has now polarization um, the horizontal. So this is the rule in this sort of situation. Every time that you put 
pass that light pass a filter with certain polarization adopts it adopts the polarization of the of the filter so and now let's let's compare beads versus quantum beads well a building block as we said of classical computational device device is the two state system zero one we all know that instead instead of either zero or one quantum allows a superposition that means replaces this notion of zero and one with any linear combination of this form alpha zero plus beta one so here by this notation we mean the vector one zero and by this notation we mean the the vector zero one so whenever you see this linear combination you should really think of the vector a b the column vector a b so in reality as mathematician we can we can start thinking of a qubit as something that is isomorphic to a two-dimensional um, complex vector uh, in accordance with this rule so and what is a measurement for us measurement for us as mathematicians is that we get zero with probability a squared and one in this concept with probability beta squared so at this point we have discussed and we have uh, seen what is photon what is a measurement of the photon we saw that the qubit is the simplest re realization um, of a photon and um, and now if we wanted to measure a single qubit and um, if we want to measure a qubit a times zero plus b one in the computational base is zero one then this is something that returns zero with probability a squared returns one with probability b squared and project to the basic uh, basis state corresponding to the measurement result and what is the interesting um, result of this way of doing measurement and first of all a qubit can be measured with respect to any ortho orthogonal basis for a two-dimensional state space but what it is interesting is that only one classical bit of information can be extract extracted from one qubit so this is something that it will be very interesting in the continuation so one of the limitations let's say of quantum computing a lot of people consider this a limitation uh, is that there is something known as the no cloning theorem so and what does the theorem says is that an unknown quantum state cannot be reliably copied and you can see what implications this has for computations for instance very often when you have nonlinearity, because i'm interested in nonlinear analysis in nonlinear problems nonlinear problems involve and um, powers of unknowns so the first time that somebody tried to solve um to construct a quantum algorithm that is appropriate for nonlinear system the first idea that they had was to represent the nonlinearity as multiple copies of uh, a given vector and in reality this method approach phase and we're going to say more about this throughout the semester because of, of this particular um, aspect of the fact because of the fact that you cannot really reliably copy um, um, uh, a quantum state so all right so the next uh, question that um, somebody may ask is okay and this is will be the topic of uh, subsequent lectures actually how state space combine so let's say that i have two vector spaces the vector space x with basis a1 alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha n so this is an n-dimensional space because the number of the elements of the basis is n then we have another vector space y and this vector space is an n-dimensional vector space because the number of the elements of the basis is m 
So a classical state space is combined via, as we call it, Cartesian product. So if you consider the X times uh, Y space, this space will have a basis that consists of the sum of the two bases. So it will contain, consist of all the vectors. So in this setting, the dimension of this, of this space can be simply given as N plus N. Look now what quantum state spaces do. Quantum state spaces combine via tensor products. Right now, this um, X tensor Y consists of many, many, many copies of multiplications of elements. And if you see what is the dimension of this new space, the dimension of this new space is N times N. So this is a very interesting um, observation that has a lot of implications. So what is some of the implications? In general, n qubit state, and this is something we will discuss this in the subsequent lecture, can be written as a linear combination of uh, quantities of this form. We have to use a little bit combinatorics in order to understand what is the lower limit and the upper limit, but we are going to have more discussions about this. So a general n qubit state can be written in some sense as a summation of this form, where these coefficients have a certain property. So the, the sum of a i squared is equal to one. So now what is happening? Since two n is much less than two to the power n, so two to the power n, where does this, this number came from? Notice that we have n qubit. Notice that each qubit can be expressed as a linear combination of two vectors, let's say horizontal perpendicular. So think about a little bit combinatorically, and we are going to see that the inter question of interest is two to the power n. So that means since two n is much less than two to the power n, most n qubit states cannot be described by the states of the individual qubits. So what does this mean? That means that most states cannot be uh, written as a tensor products of individual qubit states, which means that all states can be written as a linear combination of such states. So why this is relevant? This is relevant because it allows us, and um, it, it, it brings us to the concept of entanglement. States that cannot be written as a tensor product of individual qubit states, states are called entangled states. So, and since the dimensionality is so different, it turns out that most of the states are entangled states. So entanglement um, can have positive uh, effects and negative effects. One of the positive effects is that, um, it produces the ability of the system to make calculations grows not in a linear function, but exponentially. So entanglement can be responsible for speeding up computations, basically. What is the limitation? The limitation is, and the big weakness uh, for quantum computing is that the tiniest bit of interference from the outside world can break the fragile correlation between two or more qubits. So there is some advantages and disadvantages that we are getting from entanglement. The speed up is an advantage that can come from um, having states that are entangled. The limitation is that the fragile correlations between the qubits can create a big problem. Are we okay? Am I going to pass? It's okay, we will come, we have many times to, uh, many occasions to repeat a lot of this uh, concept. I want to tell you something about the available hardware. Um, nowadays, we have some uh, physical machineries, as we can. For instance, IBM has their own um, quantum computer, in quotation, <laughs> machinery that uh, relies on quantum mechanical effects. Our own University of Maryland, and we are the birthplace of, of a technology. It is called IonQ that use uh, trapped ions. 
uh, there is a, a machine from this um, company, Rigetti, um, and there is uh, another um, technology which is uh, called Big Wave. So these three um, type of companies, uh, these three technologies using as a, the physics, the physical property that they use is ion trapping. Big wave relies on quantum annealing and superconduction conductivity. But we will discuss a lot about this. Here on this side, I have created a ranking. And this is an artificial ranking, by the way. I simply wanted, since right now, we know about qubits. So I wanted to, to give you a, a ranking about uh, how many qubits each one of these technologies can handle. IBM right now can handle 40, 433 qubits, and the processor is the so-called Osprey. Ion Q, 27 qubits, and he, you, they use uter ion, 171. Rigetti, 82 qubits, and the wave 1,800 qubits using quantum annealing. So we're going to tell me, does this mean that ion Q is the worst? No, because we are, there are so many ways to evaluate the different technologies. One question is how many qubits they can handle, but there are more. There is the concept of fidelity that we're going to learn. So we want to see how robust the computations can be, how noise, how noisy the systems can get. And uh, so I, I'm going to, in every lecture that I'm going to give, I'm going to give you a different ways to run this, um, uh, technologies, and you're going to see that each one of these technologies uses that measurement that benefits them. IBM using the concept of fidelity, for instance. IonQ has a different type of concept that measures success. But we're going to discuss this in a subsequent uh, lecture. So together with this available hardware, we have cloud services. So what happens in practice is that People cannot run quantum algorithms very often directly in this machine, but they can access uh, using classical simulators. So the IonQ, the machines that are uh, provided by IonQ, can be accessed through the Amazon Web Services. And so this can provide uh, an interesting contrast. In reality, the dream is to be able to do directly computations here. Okay, so that's why I mentioned this idea of error co-direction and try to understand the noises, how noisy the systems are, because the dream is that one day we will be able to access the technology without relying, relying on simulators. And I don't want you to look at this slide. This slide describes potential applications. For me, the hope for the time being is that this uh, Quantum models that are created will play a role in drug, uh, drug discovery, healthcare, and in material science, science for the discovery of new materials. There are a lot of crazy notions in the slides about potential uses, but I want you to look at this and I want you to look at this because this is something realistic. Quantum simulations were gener generated, were developed in order to simulate physics. So the applications that I believe uh, will be the first applications that will be um, create, let's say, the killer app, as they, saw, as they say, something that we're going to have end-to-end -end, uh, applications uh, are with reference to chemistry and condensed matter physics. Chemistry, why chemistry? Because in chemistry, we have a lot of molecules. The dimensionality is extremely huge. You want to use quantum algorithms on problems for which the dimensionality is, is big, okay? Because this is where you're going to see the advantage. And I wanted to give you in this uh, lecture the definition of um, the so-called quantum simulator simulation problem because we're going to see a lot of um, related uh, results subsequently. So what is the quantum simulation problem that will play such a big role in, um, in advancing the field? 
is the following. Given a description of a physical system, and by this, as a mathematician, we mean we, we mean given a description of a Hamiltonian, because the Hamiltonian describes the physics of the problem. And given a, a Hamiltonian, an evolution time a, n, a t, uh, and an initial state c0, the goal of quantum simulation is to produce the final state. And you know, do you have to pro produce it um, explicitly? Well, within a certain error tolerance, let's say epsilon. So a classical computer cannot even represent the state efficiently if you have an, a high, a very high dimensional space, a vector in a very high dimensional space, you cannot even write it down with a classical computer. So a classical computer cannot even represent the state efficiently. A quantum computing, I, I want this is something that I want to discuss with you further in the subsequent lectures, cannot really produce a complete description of the state, but by performing what we call the measurements, it can answer questions that apparently a classical computer cannot. And we are going to come into this. What are the type of conclusions we can get? What kind of description of the final system we can get using a, a quantum computer? If you have a measurement, a me measurement gives you a set of probability distributions. Already, already having a set of probability distributions, if, even though you cannot write explicitly the answer to a given problem, it gives you some information about the problem. So this is where the, the power of quantum simulation um, comes. And very often people say that quantum simulations is one of the most compelling potential applications of quantum computers. So um, we are going to come back into that. And let me, I just, I, I offer this slide here because I want to say that there is another sense in which quantum simulations, Hamiltonian simulations can be useful. And this is in the implementation of quantum algorithms. And we are going to, to discuss um, several types of, of algorithms um, in, this, uh, in this year, during this year. For instance, there is um, um, an algorithm which relies on adiabatic optimization. This algorithm, uses the, the adiabatic theorem of continuum mechanics. And in some sense, what it does, it tries to find the minimum uh, of a given function by oscillating between two Hamiltonians. There are quantum algorithms that rely on what is known, uh, what are known as quantum walks. That there is the quantum version of uh, the classical random walks in some sense. There are uh, algorithms that rely on the evaluation of Boolean formulas. And of course, something that we are going to do it to discuss extensively is uh, solving linear and nonlinear differential equation and convex optimization problems using um, some sort of algorithm. So uh, is there any questions so far? Um, yes. Oh, never mind. There'll be there. I, I'm here. Why so much buzz about quantum? Let me just say this. Why so much buzz about quantum? Here, this is a, a, um, this is a, a study, a posting on December 2021. There are subsequent um, studies, and I'm going to show you the source where you can look. Notice that there is a very big gap between the number of jobs posting and the number of quantum technology master's level graduates yearly. This, this number has, this gap has increased in recent years as it is shown um, in this study by IBM, uh, the quantum decay. And what is happening is that um, what needs to happen, organizations, have to somehow intervene and to work in order to ensure that the people that work in the industry have the necessary skills to deal with the new technology. So the same problem was initially present when AI came out, artificial intelligence. There has to be some sort of um, 
education of the public, of the worker, of the workforce, in order to be able to handle the new technology. So, and that being said, I wanted to uh, present to you that we are doing something at the University of Maryland. We have, um, right now, we are offering um, a graduate certificate on quantum computing and the Master's of Professional Studies of Quantum Computing and a Master's of Science in Quantum Computing. This is uh, an effort, a um, joint effort of the Institute for Physical Science and Technology and the Science Academy. And if you want, you should look at the website to, to see the possibilities. And I want to say something. You are here today, and what do we envision to see happening in this uh, research training group is to create groups of students consisting of undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, faculty in pure mathematics, applied mathematics, physics, and to try to work on problems. And here I want to show you, this is because it's my paper, let me brag a little bit, that then this, this uh, result, we created the constructed the first efficient quantum algorithm for, and we're going to see what this means. It is related to the complexity. It was an exponential speed up in time and for uh, solving um, a class of um, nonlinear systems that has some uh, dissipation, but it consists a lot of physical uh, systems and systems in epidemiology. And the reason that I want to present this is because this is the, I want us to create, and this is the goal of this, um, of this uh, uh, effort to create teams. Look at this team. This team consisted of a graduate student in math. I am a mathematician. Harry Crowley, at the time he was working at the Rayton DBN Technologies in East, the industry. Now he's working in a different uh, company, Raylane.com. Uh, but he is a person working in the industry. Herman. He's an, was an undergraduate at the time that he did this work, and still he made a very big contributions. And Nuno, uh, an engineer at MIT, and Natalie Child is one of the leaders in quantum computing in our university and the leader of the Challenge Institute. Okay, this team, he took this team that consists of, the team is highly interdisciplinary, and it is cross-sector um, team that consists both of uh, are the graduates and graduate students. By the way, Stephen Liu is now a PhD student in Berkeley and currently in MIT. And Herman, I haven't heard the latest, but I think he will start graduate school soon. Our, our hope in this RIT is to encourage each one of you, graduates and undergraduates, to join us to try to identify problems that um, we can attack together and by learning together, because each one of us in this team, we are new into the field. You know, we are, that's why we have in our group people like Carl Miller and Adri Childs, both of them copy I of this problem, because these people have worked from many, many years in the, in the field. And we are learning together. I mean, I'm learning from them, and all of us, we are going to learn together. So, uh, that's why I'm very excited to see you all today, and I hope that you will join us and that you will be part of our effort in order to create teams, to find problems that, depending on your background, you may be interested in physics, you may be interested in biological problems, and we can find the right problem to work on and to make contribution. And we would like your feedback because we appreciate you very much. Thank you for your attention.